No, praise the Lord. Praise God. Let's, let's just ask God's blessing upon our offering. I know that the offering plates are there at the door, but let's just pray over that. Father, we just ask you to bless this offering, bless gift and giver. We pray that you would use it for the advancement of the kingdom of God and that your purpose and plan would be fulfilled in and through each of our lives, Lord, as we are faithful to give. Lord, of the tithe and of the offering, Lord, we know that you give back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And we give you thanks and praise for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, if you would. Um, there are so many things that uh, this passage of Scripture, and we're going to look at several of the passages all the way up to chapter 50. We're not going to read all of those, of course, but uh, I just want to share some things with you. The title of this message is Wait on the Lord, Wait on the Lord. And so how many of you like to wait? I was in line yesterday and at McDonald's, and as I was going through the lines, very busy, both lines, very busy, very long, and, you know, we can get frustrated when fast food isn't fast, you know. Well, it's still pretty fast when you think about it. But I was sitting there, and there was a, a young man in a car to the right kiosk ordering, and I had already ordered and moved up some, but he came around the corner, and, I, and if you go every other car, he would have been next, even though I had ordered, so I went ahead and waved him ahead and, and let him go ahead, ahead of me. He had a very fancy car, very sporty type of a car. I couldn't tell you what it was right now, but... Uh, on that was a hand in several places on the vehicle with the middle finger up. And I, I thought, oh, if I'd have known that, that was my first instinct. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have let him go ahead of me. And then the Lord dealt with my heart right then. I mean, seriously, right then the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you need to pray for that young man. You need to lift him before the Lord because you don't know what his family circumstances have been, what he was raised with, the type of influence that he's had in his life. And so I will mark that down. He is on my prayer list. I don't know his name, but the Lord knows his name. And I thought, well, this fits with waiting <laughs> because in the midst of that, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I don't know what's going to happen with that young man, but I'm going to pray for him. Don't know his name. But he is now embedded in my mind, and I will remember him. And I prayed for him the whole time as we went through that line and, and as we moved up to, to make our payment. And I'm praying for him, and I'm praying, God, open his heart, open his life so that he might have a relationship with you. Help him to have somebody come across his path that Lord knows you. And if there's anyone in his family that knows you, dear God, speak to them to speak to that life and to minister to him. And even, Lord, if, if the opportunity presents itself, may I be able to see him again and to be able to share the gospel. But if I can't, let somebody else come to him and to minister to his life. How many of you mothers are still praying for family members, for sons and for daughters, and you're praying and you're believing and you're going to trust God? You have a dream that God has given to you. You've got a promise that he's given to you that you and your family will be saved and, and you're trusting the Lord to move and to minister in those lives. Well, I want us to, to start this morning. We need hope because where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. You see, the dreams that God has given to you, those things that he has placed in your heart and in your life, if you don't believe those and there's no power for today, you have to have that future hope and that belief that God is going to work and that he is going to minister in your heart and in the hearts of those that you're praying for. And you can stand upon his word. God wants to work. You see, the anchor of hope is to know God this morning, to know him and be in relationship with him. And so if you have relationship with him, you'll, and you'll see as we go through this passage that even Joseph had somewhat forgotten the dream that he had had until his brothers knelt before him. It says he remembered then his dreams that God had given to him. And so you hold on to those dreams. You hold on to them and believe 
for the very best and that God wants to move. You see, the answer to hopelessness is God. He is our hope and he is our strength. The reason to keep on keeping on is because God will come through. That's the God that we serve and we see that in this story. Those who will be used of God are always those who have given a trust and proven themselves faithful before the Lord. Faithfulness. There was the Sunday school talked about steadfastness this morning. I believe it's similar in, in, in relation to faithfulness, being committed no matter what the storm, no matter what the difficulty might be, that God wants to work and he wants to minister. Faithfulness does not doubt God. It doesn't doubt his salvation. It doesn't doubt his provision. It doesn't doubt his strength for help in the times that we need him to come along and come up beside us and strengthen us. Faithfulness does not let up or give up. It keeps on going. It is steadfast. It moves forward. Faithfulness does not give in to temptations or to tough times. God has given us strength and power to be overcomers. Faithfulness begins with God and continues with God. And so we must stand with him in difficulties. Joseph was a man who was faithful. He was faithful even though he was sold into slavery. He was faithful. Faithfulness is a key to the willingness to wait on God for the promises and the dreams that we have been given from him to be fulfilled. We want to see the presence of God fulfilled. We want to see his promises fulfilled in our lives and those dreams to come to pass. Often the waiting is the hardest thing to do. None of us like to wait. We're not patient. We live in a society that everything is quickly given to us. And we, we see it instantly almost. But there are a lot of things that we have to wait for. If, if, we want, uh, if we want a good steak dinner, how many of you stick your steak in the microwave? Nobody? No, you got to wait. you gotta, you got to do that properly. Put it on the grill and you, you, you take time to, to turn it. You season it. It's going to take time to season that. Well, you know, back in, in Bible times, if they were going to prepare a meal, it wasn't anything instant about it. It took them, they'd have to go out and kill the calf. The fatted calf. And then they have to bring it in. They have to sacrifice it. They had to prepare that meal. It took a lot of time. And we've gotten so used to things so instantly and so quickly in our lives. But often the waiting is the hardest thing to to do. At times we are given promises, but we don't see the fulfillment of those promises immediately. But we must wait patiently. Wait patiently. Quite often... It is the family where we see the area of delayed promises and dreams for our lives at times. It's in our own families. It's in those situations. Sometimes it's even in our church. How many of us are believing for God to pour out His Spirit at Litchfield Assembly of God? And you've been praying that for a long time. How many of you believe that God wants to bring more souls into the kingdom and we're trusting the Lord to to bring that about and to bring it to pass? We're believing God to move. And so we must continue on in faithfulness in commitment unto the Lord. We know what his word has said. We are believing for things uh, that that may seem difficult to to see, possibly because we haven't seen them yet. But that's not faith. Faith isn't, isn't seeing with our eyes. Faith is believing before we see it with our eyes. And that's what faith is all about. And so being faithful in the midst of whatever we might be facing and going through. So what is a family? A family is not simply a group of people dwelling under one roof, bearing the same name. You know, I, I know I've run across people that, that have Hartshorn as their last name. I've even been to the bank, and, and they said, now which Hartshorn are you? Because, so I know there's some other Hartshorns in the, at that bank, and they're not just my family members. They have the same name, but it's not the same family. Although... We, we come from English descent is my understanding. But a family can, can have a, a variety of compositions. There are a variety of things that go on in, in each family. A family is not simply people, but it's a spirit of oneness. It's something that takes place in our hearts and in our lives. A spirit produced through life and faith. In the family, we learn the difference between a house and a home. You know, plumbers, electricians. You know, builders, they build a house, but it's the people that are in it that make a home. It's you and I that make a home, that God wants to to work through us and work in us in those days. A home is where the family resides. Only you and yours can build a home. It's you in that home, in that family, that builds a family and builds a home. The family is the basic 
is the basic place where the uh, nurturing of faith takes place. I don't believe that the family can be overstated today. How many of you are familiar with uh, Focus on the Family? Dr. David Dobson uh, ministered uh, for years through uh, Focus on the Family. It's still, a, a, it's still continuing on in ministry, still continuing to go forth. You see, the basis of, of America today, if we're going to stand as a nation, we need families to be strong. If the church is going to stand today, we need families that are strong. And we need to believe God to move. The, no church, no nation or civilization rises higher than the spirit of faith and worship that prevails in the home and in the church and in the family. The family of God that works together and ministers together. If we don't build our homes on the unshifting sands of Jesus Christ, then we will falter. We need Jesus in our homes, in our families, in our nation. As the family goes, goes so, so goes the nation and so goes the church. We need families that are strong. The family is the unit of living, uh, of living that God dis designed and created. He put it together. He designed it. Adam and Eve started out as the first mother and father of, uh, of, of all of creation. They were a family, and God had put them together. Com what does family do? It combats loneliness. I don't know about you, but some of what I've seen as uh, what's been going on with COVID is that people have been isolated so often and so much that they're away from, from family and, and when family can get together in fellowship. How many of you are fellowshipping with your families even though COVID is taking place? Say amen. amen. We're fellowshipping. We, we need that. The family helps to, to ease some of those things that are going on and taking place. Hands, hand down, uh, we hand down truth from parents to children. We are to pass on the truth of the gospel from our lives to the lives of our children and to our grandchildren, uh, from our children to their children, to foster and, and to develop God's plan for those who are his. That's what God has designed us for. And mothers, this morning, I want, you to, I want to encourage you, and fathers, don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your hope for your family. God is going to bring it together. He is going to work. In the home, we can instill life-changing principles that will become bedrock foundations. The principles that you set in your home. Now, we've all run across people that we say, boy, they, they have no principles. There's no, there's no morality in their lives. And most of those situations started in their homes. In their homes. That was the principles. What are the principles that we're laying down in our homes and in our families today? We hear great truths at church, but where are those going to be implemented? They won't be implemented at church. They're going to be implemented. They have to be implemented at, at home. That's where they have to be instilled within the lives of our children and our grandchildren and even within our spouses to minister to their lives. We are to implement and bring them to life in our home and in our family. That's what God's called us to do today. Today, the first family of Israel is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Jacob and his sons and Joseph this morning. And that's what I want us to grab hold of today. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 37 here in just a moment. But it's, it, we, what we see here is a picture of a dream delayed for a son, a dream that was delayed for a son, and then we also see a dream that died for a dad. A dream that died for a dad. Jacob, who is later called Israel, that's why I say it's Israel's first family, because later we see that Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Families are fractured. Why do families get fractured? Disinterest, for one, they become interested in only the things that they want to do. They don't stay focused on their families, so they become disinterested in their families. Dishonor. Sometimes it's dishonor. I don't want to honor my father nor my mother anymore. I don't want to honor my siblings. I don't want to show them honor. And so it's dishonor. And then there's dishonesty. Dishonesty that we see within the home sometimes and within the family. We're not open. We're not receptive. We're not willing to share what really is going on inside of us. And we can be dishonest at times. And then there's displacement. What is displacement? It's due to jealousy. It's due to anger. It's due to rage and retribution. I'm going to get them back. Uh, 
Any of you ever have any battles with your brothers and sisters growing up? Huh? <laughs> any of you have drag out fights? Any, anybody ever have downright drag out fights with a sibling? You know, there's retribution. There's times that, oh, I want to get even. I want to get them back for what they did to me. Well, here we're going to see that many families today are fractured. Many families are, 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 are struggling. They're, they're battling because of bad relationships and all because of these areas. This proliferation of fractured families will negatively impact the church and the nation. And so we need strong families. We need families that stay together. You say, and most of you here, you say, well, my kids are grown. They're gone. They're no longer in my home. How many of you know you still have an influence in your family's lives? Fathers, mothers, you have an influence in the lives of your children. Even though they may be out of the home, you have an impact upon them. Take with me and turn to Genesis 37, if you would. Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to read, we're going to start there in the first verse. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is, is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he, and his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now I'm sure that's going to go well. How many of you ever brought a bad report about your brother or sister? And they just loved you for it. They were so glad when you brought that report. Well, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to, to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Father, I ask you this morning that as we share with regards to this fractured family and the struggles that they went through, may we learn from their experiences. May we, dear God, put our hope and our confidence and our trust in you that you are the God that is able to do the impossible in families that may be fractured. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would intervene and that you would work and that, Lord, in all those things that seem to be out of alignment, that, Lord, you would bring them back into alignment and that your Holy Spirit would direct and strengthen hearts and lives. And we'll give you thanks and praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, Joseph's story in Genesis, it's a biblical picture, I believe, of what God can do in a fractured family when one person is fully committed unto the Lord. When one person fully commits as Joseph had committed unto the Lord, you think your family is fractured? You need to really take a close look at this family because this family was vengeful. They sell Joseph, of course, into slavery. They wanted to kill him, but Reuben stopped them from killing him. And we see that, now I don't know if you've ever felt like you wanted to kill your brother or sister, but, you know, this family, that's what they wanted to do. They spoke of it. They were intending to do it. And if not for the oldest brother, Reuben, intervening, they probably would have killed Joseph at that time, although God had a different plan. And that's why he put Reuben in the place that he did.
praise the Lord. But in Genesis chapters 39 and 41, we learn of Joseph's faithfulness. This is, uh, you, you just have to love this story. Now, first off, I think we have to understand that Joseph might have been a little bit immature sharing his dreams the way that he did. You know, it brought a lot of fracturing to the family. I'm, I'm sure that Jacob said, what in the world are you doing? I'm trying to get my family together. And here you go sharing this kind of a dream, saying that we're going to all bow down to you one day. And, and so he's thinking, I've got to get this thing together. But now, I don't think Jacob really did all that he could to keep from fracturing his own family because of showing the favoritism that he did to his young son, Joseph. Sometimes we can have a tendency, even in a family, sometimes to show uh, preference over one child or another, and that can cause problems within the relationships within the family. But we see that Joseph's faithfulness, his uprightness, his walk before the Lord, he continued forward. He didn't let being sold into slavery stop him from doing his very best for the Lord. That's what his desire was. Joseph refused to become bitter. Instead, through the circumstances, he became better. And this was God's preparation. You think sometimes you're going through a storm, you're going through a difficulty, a battle in your life, and you wonder, why in the world am I going through this? Well, what, what is the Lord doing? He's preparing you for what he has in store for you that he wants to do. And sometimes it looks like it's disaster. Sometimes it looks like it's going to be this thing that's going to tear you apart. But instead, what it does is it builds you up and it grows you and it teaches you in the midst of that. You see, Joseph's brothers became bitter and vengeful because of the way Joseph was and because of the favoritism that the father had shown. You see, Joseph trusted in God when everyone else had failed him. Let me tell you something. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what struggle or battle you might be facing today, but I know this. Everybody else might fail you, but God never will. He will always stand with you. If you'll call on him, if you'll call him his own, and you'll serve him and live for him, he'll stand with you and, and be with you and direct your steps and strengthen you in those times of difficulty. When one committed is committed to the Lord, it can turn the whole family around. Don't allow yourself to become bitter over past circumstances. Because Joseph was faithful, he enjoyed fruitfulness and he enjoyed favor. You know, every place that he went, in Potiphar's home to start with, he was there and, and, and of course the wife tried to seduce him and he wouldn't have anything to do with it, but he was found, he found favor there. He was thrown into the dungeon and he finds favor with the jailer and he's put into a position of authority. He saw the abilities that Joseph had and through that he was growing him. The Lord was growing him. He was teaching him the things that were necessary to be able to be the ruler eventually, to be in the palace. That's what God was doing. And so whatever you're going through, God is teaching you. He's training you. He's preparing you for the next step that he has for your life. You see, Joseph started in a pit, but he was elevated to the palace. That's what God does. He works in our lives, and, and he started out in a pit, but God elevated him and put him in a palace. How could that happen? How could that happen? Only by God. Let me tell you, it's only by God. God can do the impossible, and he worked through Joseph's life. Well, when Pharaoh couldn't understand the dream that he had had. He finds out through the cupbearer, who the cupbearer who had forgotten Joseph, uh, after he had gotten out of prison, the baker lost his head, but the cupbearer, he ends up getting out of prison and forgets all about Joseph. And, and I imagine Joseph sitting there and saying, man, God, why, what did I do to deserve this? Uh, he was supposed to say something. He was supposed to do something, and here I am. I don't know how Joseph felt. But I know that at times he must have felt abandoned. He must have felt like, where are you at, God? What's going on? But he was faithful. He was faithful. And so now Pharaoh has a dream. And what's the dream? That there were going to be seven good years followed by seven bad years. And so he puts Joseph in charge. Joseph's faithful. Joseph's faithful. Joseph led Pharaoh to save provisions for those seven years and then to pass it on to those that were in need for all, all of the area, not just Egypt, because Jacob and his sons come also. Eventually his sons come to get provision, 
And we see that God brings that about. In Genesis chapter 42, Joseph's dream was realized in a way that no one could conceive. The brothers were sent by Jacob. The man that had his dream dashed, the dream that was now in his mind dead. I want you to catch that. The dream that he thought was now dead because he thought his son Joseph was dead was going to, about to be brought back to life. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, you know, some of the dreams that you've had, some of the things that you know the Lord has laid upon your heart and you haven't seen them happen yet. Some of you maybe for 20, 30, 40 years. But God still says, if I gave you the promise, I will stand upon that promise and I'll give it to you. I'll fulfill that dream that you've had that I gave to you. But you see, not knowing, uh, his brothers came looking for food and they bowed down to him. They bowed down to, to Joseph there. It was, it was just the dream that he had had and he saw it. He saw this vividly now. God's awesome. When he gives a dream, he's going to fulfill that dream. Look with me at chapter 42 of Genesis, beginning in the sixth verse, if you would. You see, through a series of events that works, it works out that all of the brothers come before Joseph at this time. Genesis 42, 6. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now listen to this. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams. He remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they said. They answered, Your servant has come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servant are honest men, not spies. Now I want you to hear that word. We are honest men. We are honest men. Catch it. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Honest men. Honest men? I don't think so. I don't think so. They were not very honest. For one, they didn't know where their brother was for sure. They said he's no more because they'd already told their father that he was dead. They soaked his coat that he had give, given to them, the coat of many colors, soaked it in the blood and took it back and said that Joseph was dead. So Jacob's dream is dead. But not in God's eyes. He was still working. He was still working in the midst of this. Reading on, Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in, the custody, in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we, will be, we are punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an account for his blood. They, will, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using 
an interpreter. You think about poor old Reuben. He was the only one, but yet Reuben wasn't held guiltless for what took place. But what do we find out? We find out later that we find that Joseph's response to his family. And this is amazing. When, when you think about how they treated him, how their intention was to kill them, kill him. Uh, and they sell him into slavery. But later we find that his response to his family out of the act of his will. I want you to grab that because the act of our will. What will you do when somebody harms you? What will you do when someone hurts you? How will you treat them in, in, in response? This is the way that we should treat them, by giving. Be a giving person. Don't stop giving. Don't stop ministering. They, Joseph was in a, power, a place of power and a position. What's he do? He gives them grain to take back for their family. He gives them supplies to be able to take back for his father, Jacob. And then we need to choose to be forgiving. We can hold on to those things in our lives and, and that bitterness and, and be angry constantly and become bitter with our spirit and never forgive that person. And all it does is harm us. All it does is harm us. But he was willing to forgive. And then be honoring. Be honoring. He was going to still honor his, his brothers and to honor his father. And why was he doing this? Why was he putting them through the test? He wanted to see if his brothers had changed. There was a reason behind what he was doing. He loved them and he cared for them and he had been following the Lord faithfully. We see in Genesis 50 that Joseph's response to God, Joseph chose to focus not on the harm that they intended for him, no, but on the good that God intended for them all. That's his desire. How many of you know that God desires good for all? Amen? That's what his desire is. Joseph's attitude toward God was be willing, be willing, be persevering, and be faithful. You see, we need to be willing no matter what comes our way, no matter how badly we've been hurt, we need to be willing to serve God no matter how many times people have hurt us. How many of you have ever been hurt by people in the church? Raise your hand. I, I think everybody could raise their hand. I think you're just being, you're being, you're being modest or humble here uh, by not raising your hand. I think we've all probably been hurt at one time or another. Something that somebody said. The scripture says we're going to be offended, but we're not to take offense. We're not to take offense. We're to love one another. We're to love one another. That's what God's called us to do. We need to be persevering. We need to be faithful. You know, you see the message to those with delays and detours. Don't be a prisoner of your past. Don't be a prisoner of your past. Don't let the enemy hold you in that spot so that you can't move forward. Until you can forgive, it's going to be hard for you to get to the destiny that God desires for your heart and for your life. He wants to bring you to a, a, a new level and a new place in your walk and your relationship with him. Like Joseph, choose to, to have God's mindset towards those who have injured you. Choose to have his mindset. In Genesis 50, 20, what did, what did he say? He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You see, there are things that come about in our lives, and, and we can say, well, yeah, that was so-and-so. And some of the hurts that we've had, that we've experienced, where people have come after us or said things about us and, and done things, in, in that respect, we know that God is still in control of all of that, and we need to learn and grow through those experiences and those circumstances and not let, us, let it keep us from moving forward. You know, everybody, is, every one of us, I would think at one time or another, has been let down by somebody. We've let somebody down or they've let us down. June Hutt says in Bible Counseling Keys, she says this, God can use your mess to become your message. And he can use your test to become your testimony. He can use your test to become your testimony, and God can use your mess to become your message. You see, there are things that God brings you through that he's developing you and things that he allows in your life because he wants to grow you and develop you. God's word assures us that through the good times and the bad that God is unfolding a perfect plan for you. That's what God is doing. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. 
How many of you are God's children this morning? Say amen. amen. Then he has a perfect plan for you. Amen? He has a perfect plan for your heart and for your life. He desires to work in you and through you. Now I want to switch gears here. I want to talk about Jacob for a little bit here. I want to talk about Jacob. Jacob's reaction to the dream. He didn't understand it. It wasn't his dream. He didn't understand it. There are some of you that the Lord has given you dreams and you've maybe shared them, and, but other people don't understand it. That's because it's your dream. It's your dream. And so what do we do sometimes when we don't comprehend something? We sometimes rebuke that person. And that's what Jacob does here. He re, his first reaction was to rebuke Joseph. What do you, who do you think you are that you're, I'm going to come and bow down to you? Who do you think you are to say that? So he rebukes his son. He rebukes his son. While his sons were jealous of Joseph, Jacob's father listened, though. And this was the thing. It says that he kept that thing in his mind. He didn't stop thinking about it. He kept that in focus. And so there are some things that you and I, when we hear them, instead of rebuking, we need to focus and say, I need to keep this in the forefront of my mind. I need to be thinking about this. Turn with me to Genesis 40 through 45. Beginning in the third verse. Joseph said to his brothers, I, Joseph, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. They had said the last time that they were there that the one was no more. Can you imagine? They had to, their jaw had to drop. What in the world? You're Joseph. And they hadn't recognized him. He spoke through an interpreter. He knew everything that they had said. But they didn't understand the things that he said when he was speaking in their language, the Egyptian language. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Tell me that Joseph didn't learn a few things while he was in Egypt. Folks, sometimes we can hold such anger and bitterness towards people. And sometimes it's what God designed and, and allowed to take place so that we might grow and that we might develop. And that's what happened with Joseph. He grew through it. He didn't become bitter. He says, this was so that lives could be saved. There was a reason behind it. Could God have done it a different way, not his brothers turning on him? Sure, he could have. But this is the way it ended up, through their anger, through their bitterness, through their, their uh, resentful spirit towards Joseph. This is what took place, and this is what happened. He says, for two years, in verse 6, for two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Now, skip ahead to verses 25 in that same chapter. Chapter 25. Or verse 25, excuse me. Chapter 45, verse 25. It says this. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. I'll bet they couldn't wait to tell their dad that Joseph was alive. Let me tell you something. Those things that are hidden, God will reveal. 
God will bring them to light. Those things that we, we, we think are done in the dark and they're going to eventually be shown the light. The light will be revealed in those situations in the lives of people. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. The dream that's dead is now coming to life. It's coming to life. It's coming. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. When they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father revived. The dream, the hope, that was dead has now been brought back to life. Only God, folks, only God. So whatever your dream is, whatever God has laid upon your heart, when your family is fractured, God can restore and he can revive it. He can do the work that no one else can do. He can revive it. When your dream has died, God can bring it back to life. He can bring it to life, folks. Hold on to the dreams that God has given to you and placed in your heart and in your life. Hold on to them. And trust the Lord. Jacob's dream was dead, but it was now revived. Joseph must have wondered, when are you going to, to bring it to pass? You know, all of those years that Joseph was without his family, pretty much left out there on his own other than his Lord, and he never gave up on his Lord, ever gave up on his Lord. When God gives a dream, his delays are not denials. But when God gives it, you can count on it coming to pass. It is going to take place. There are things that the Lord has spoken through dreams that people have shared with me that I'm still believing God for in this fellowship that I believe are going to come to pass. Why? Because he gave it to somebody that I had, I, I see the, and had confidence in, in in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe those dreams are going to come to pass because he gave them. The process will often determine the end product. So what process are you going through right now, season after season? How many of you know you can't skip the steps? How many of you, you know, when I was younger, I liked to see how many steps I could go at a time. You ever do that? I don't do that anymore. Every once in a while, I will step all the way up onto this pulpit, but I'm a little more cautious the older that I get to do something like that because a lot of times my, my toe will get caught on that, on that very last portion of that pulpit or this platform when I go to step up. And so I, I'm very careful. I'm very careful. You know, sometimes we think we can skip steps in the process that God is working in our lives. We think that we, because we're not being patient with God, we're not waiting on the Lord, and we think that we can move ahead, and we move ahead on our own, how many of you know we get in trouble? Every time, we will get in trouble. But see, when God gives a dream, his delays are not denials. Great things may take a while for God to, to work. Joseph had to grow up a little bit in the whole process. The hardest thing to learn is to wait. Wait on the Lord. Uh, are you teaching, are you being taught by the Spirit of God? Turn with me to Isaiah. I'm almost finished, I promise. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in the 27th verse. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, even Youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. 
But those who have hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You see, we serve a God that is the God of the universe, folks. He's the God that created all things. And when he gives you something, when he gives you a promise, he will not go back on that promise. How many times have we broken covenant with the Lord? I won't ever do that again, Lord. And we do it again. But God has never gone back on his word, ever, ever has he gone back on his word. He is always there. He's always faithful and always committed. What does the word wait mean? To remain in a state of readiness and expectation. Some people think waiting is just sitting and doing nothing. No, there should be a readiness and, a, and an expectation that God is about to do something. And we need to trust God. Even in the midst of what we may be facing today, we need to realize that with hope, there needs to be a great expectation that God is on the move. There should be readiness. So how am I preparing myself? Well, I need to stay in the word. I need to stay on my knees before the Lord, and I need to pray. See, waiting isn't just sitting and doing nothing. Waiting is, is, is readiness, readying myself to do what God desires to do through me, and so prepare me to move forward. No matter what you are facing, wait on the Lord and look to Him to bring you strength to conquer life's difficulties and struggles that you're going to face. We're all going to face them. If your dream is slow in coming, wait for the Lord. Just wait on Him. God can bring it to pass. God's not on your timeline. He's on His own. He, he, he's... His timing is always perfect, and he'll never be late for you. God's not on a human time standard. He's eternal, and he's not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry like you and I are. God always answers our prayers. How does God answer? Yes, now is the time. No, I have a better way or wait. I'll answer you in my time in my time because I know what's best for you. That's the way the Lord works. It's not on my time. It's on yours. And, and my encouragement to you mothers and, and fathers that are here this morning is that those that maybe have drifted, they, they're not serving the Lord, your family members, that God's going to bring them back. You keep praying. You keep believing. You keep trusting. You keep remembering and, and with expectation trust that God's going to do the work. What's our response to God? We must persevere. We cannot give up, and then God will answer. I'm going to give you some scriptures, and I want you to, you can write them down if you would. I think this is, is good for us. It's dealing with uh, those that wait will uh, receive what has been promised. And I'm going to give these, I'm going to read them, but I'm going to give you the passage if you'd like to write them down so that you have them. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 in the NIV version says this, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Those that wait are heard. Psalm 40 in verse 1 says this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He turned to me and heard my cry. Those that wait are blessed. Isaiah 30, 18. Isaiah 30, 18 says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Blessed are all who wait for him. How many of you want to be blessed? Amen? Then wait on the Lord. Wait in readiness and expectation. Those that, that wait experience his goodness. Lamentations 3.25 in the New King James Version says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The Lord is good. Amen? Amen. He is a good God. Those that wait will not be ashamed. Psalms 25 and verse 3. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. And then Proverbs 20, 22, those that wait will be delivered. Do not say, I will pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. 
And then again, Isaiah 25 and verse 9 says this, Those that wait will be glad and rejoice in salvation, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. He will be, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And then Isaiah 64 and verse 4, the last verse. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You see, those that wait will see God act on their behalf. God will work, and he will minister. He will bring strength. Wait on the Lord and hold on to your dream, and he will bring it to pass. Bow your heads with me this morning. Are you here this morning and you're saying, man, I've been waiting for a dream. I've been waiting for that thing that the Lord has promised to me and I haven't seen it come to fruition yet, but I'm still believing. Raise your hand. You're still believing. Praise God. Hallelujah. You're still believing. Hold on to the dream. How many of you are here this morning and you say, I've been discouraged and I've kind of given up on my dream, but I want to restore that today. Say it. Just lift up your hand. You, you've given up on it maybe. I see one. I see two. You've given up. Anybody else? You've given up, but you want to re renew that today. You're going to trust God. You're going to continue to believe in what God has told you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. God is faithful. God is faithful to do that which he said he would do. Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you this morning. Lord, we again say thank you for our mothers. Thank you for their commitment, their love for us. Lord, I give you thanks for my mother and the prayers that I know she prayed, the love that she showed, the compassion, the, the desire for her children to have the very best. Lord, I thank you for a mother's heart, one that cares and, and is concerned and, and does the right thing and is not afraid to discipline her children because it shows the love that she has for them. Sometimes it seems like to the child that it's harsh, but Lord, it really is showing their love how much they care because they want the very best for their children. Lord, I ask you to bless our mothers here this morning, Lord. I thank you. I'm thankful for their faithfulness, for their commitment, for their desire to serve you and to live for you. And, Father, for those that might be sitting here and their mothers aren't even serving you, but they are today. Lord, I pray for those mothers that might be away from you, dear God. Lord, that you would strengthen their hearts and speak to them minister to their lives through their children, dear God. And Father, I just ask you to be with those that, Lord, they have a dream. You've given it to them. You've spoken it to them. That promise is there, and they're standing upon it. Thank you for that, Lord. Fulfill it as they continue to be faithful. And Lord, for those that, Father, had honestly are saying, I, I had given up. But Lord, they want to renew that today. And they're going to stand upon that, Lord. And I pray for strength for them, courage to be steadfast, to be faithful, and to know that you are the God of the impossible and that you can do it. You're a good God and a great God, and that you love us and care for us. Be with us now and strengthen us as we go. We'll give you thanks and we'll give you praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. Praise God. All the mothers, there's a gift of a candle on the table out there. If all the mothers would go ahead and take one. Um, and uh, what's that? All the ladies. All the, yeah, I think we've got enough for all the ladies one. Yeah, are there more? No, I think we've got enough. Every one of the ladies can take one, please. Even if you're not a mother, that's fine. You all have motherly instincts anyway. Amen? So all the ladies, go ahead and take a candle. Take that with you and enjoy that. From us. And again, remember, next week, thank you.